express us about about her nonfiction award-winning book, Radium Girls. We are so pleased to welcome Kate Moore. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you to the Daughters of the American Revolution for sponsoring today's program. And thank you to LaSalle Library for hosting it on their Zoom account. And thank you to all of you for joining both in person and virtually. It is my honor to be presenting to you today about the Radium Girls. These women are my heroines and I don't get to talk about them that much anymore. So it's a real privilege to be able to be doing this event for you today. I'm going to start the presentation by doing a short reading from the book. This is the book, The Radium Girls. And um, I hope that sets the scene for a number of reasons. I hope it gives you a sense of how I've chosen to tell this true story. It is a history book. It is packed full of facts and sources and quotes from historical documents, but I hope it showcases that I've written in a way that's almost like a novel. Um, I hope that these women will feel like friends and characters to you, that you will walk in step with them on their journey. And I also hope that the extract introduces you to the Radium Girls, in particular to Catherine Sharp, who opens the first chapter. And that's important to me because I wrote this book so that the individual radium girls were remembered. And that is my driving mission in telling their story, both in the book and in speaking to you today. The presentation will run for about 45 minutes and there will be a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat um, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And I'm very happy to answer anything. So without further ado, let's begin. This is an edited extract from chapter one of The Radium Girls. The setting is Newark in New Jersey, and the year is 1917. Catherine Sharp had a jaunty spring in her step as she walked the brief four blocks to work. It was February 1st, 1917, but the cold didn't bother her one bit. She had always loved the winter snows of her hometown. The frosty weather wasn't the reason for her high spirits on that particular icy morning though. Today, she was starting a brand new job at the watch dial factory of the Radium Luminous Materials Corporation based on Third Street in Newark, New Jersey. It was one of her close pals who had told her about the vacancy Catherine was a lively, sociable girl with many friends, as she herself later recalled. A friend of mine told me about the watch studio, where watch dial numerals and hands were painted with a luminous substance that made them visible in the dark. The work, she explained, was interesting and a far higher type than the usual factory job. It sounded so glamorous even in that brief description. After all, it wasn't even a factory, but a studio. For Catherine, a girl who had a very imaginative temperament, it sounded like a place where anything could happen. She was an attractive girl of just 14. Her 15th birthday was in five weeks time. Standing just under five foot four, she was a very pretty little blonde with twinkling blue eyes, fashionably bobbed hair and delicate features. All her life, popular science later wrote, Catherine Sharp had cherished the desire to pursue a literary career. She was certainly go-getting. She later wrote that after her friend had given her word of the opportunities at the watch studio. I went to the man in charge and asked for a job. And that was how she found herself outside the factory on Third Street, knocking on the door and gaining admittance to the place where so many young women wanted to work. She felt almost a little starstruck as she was ushered through the studio and saw the dial painters turning diligently to their tasks. The girls sat in rows, dressed in their ordinary clothes and painting dials at top speed, their hands almost a blur to Catherine's uninitiated eyes. Each had a flat wooden tray of dials beside her. 
but it wasn't the dials that caught Catherine's eye. It was the material they were using. It was the radium. Radium. Well, it was a wonder element. Everyone knew that. Catherine had read all about it in magazines and newspapers, which were forever extolling its virtues and advertising new radium products for sale. But they were all far too expensive for a girl of Catherine's humble origins. She had never seen it up close before. It was the most valuable substance on earth, selling for $120,000 for a single gram. That's $2.2 million in today's values. To her delight, it was even more beautiful than she had imagined. Even as she watched, little puffs of it seemed to hover in the air before settling on the shoulders or hair of a dial painter at work. To her astonishment, it made the girls themselves gleam. They were using slim camel hair brushes with narrow wooden handles. Yet as fine as the brushes were, the bristles had a tendency to spread, hampering the girls' work. They had to make the brushes even finer. And there was only one way they knew of to do that. We put the brushes in our mouths, Catherine said, quite simply. But of course, it wasn't simple at all. And that seemingly innocent act of putting a paintbrush laden with radioactive radium paint between her lips would lead Catherine Sharp and all the other radium girls down a path they could never have anticipated following. It led them down a path where these women became poster girls for workers' rights, where they changed the world in science, in labour law, in health and safety. These women changed the world, and yet so many people have never heard their story. That's why it's my privilege to be talking to you about them today, because for me, these women deserve to be remembered. So who were the Radium Girls? Well, Catherine Sharp is actually a very typical example. They were young, 14, 15, 16 years of age, but actually records show that some of them were as young as 11. And they came from poor working class backgrounds, often from immigrant families. Dial painting was actually known as the elite job for the poor working girls. And that was for several reasons. Number one was the money. For the most skilled workers, it was an incredibly lucrative profession. The girls were paid by the number of dials that they painted every day. And those workers who were the most efficient and the most skilled at the job could earn more than three times the average factory floor worker. Dial painters were in the top 5% of female wage earners nationally. So at a time before women even had the vote, these women were sometimes earning more than their fathers, their husbands, if they had them. The money was an incredibly attractive part of the proposition. But there were other reasons too. One of them I didn't appreciate until I started researching my book and I traveled to the key locations in it, to New Jersey and also to Ottawa in Illinois. I looked up the women in their local town directories. In Ottawa, I looked up a woman called Catherine Dunahy. She was a key figure in this story. And next to Catherine's name, it listed her address and her profession. But next to Catherine's name, it didn't say she was a dial painter. It said artist, artist, Radium Dial Company. And that artistic nature of the job was also a huge attraction to these women. And let's not forget the historic context of the era we're talking about. So Catherine Sharp is going to work in that opening chapter on February 1st, 1917. Now, the history buffs among you will know that just a few months later in April, America joins the First World War. And that leads to a huge boom in the radium dial painting industry because the women are not just painting watches and clocks, they're painting aeronautical instruments that will light up dashboards, that will light up automobiles. And so there was a huge boom in the industry and more and more demand for workers. For many women, 
being patriotic, doing their bit for their country was a huge motivation for them to join the studio. That was certainly the case for Grace Fryer. Grace was 18 years old when war broke out. A totally extraordinary young woman, brilliant in mind and in demeanor. Grace actually had a job that paid about the same as dial painting, but she left it as soon as war broke out because she wanted to contribute to the war effort. She had two brothers who had gone to fight in France and Grace Fryer was not going to sit idly by and do nothing while her country was at war. With the increased demand for workers, one of the real tragedies of this story for me, and there are many, is that because all these vacancies suddenly opened up, the women who were lucky enough to have secured positions promoted the vacancies to those closest to them, their cousins, their friends, their sisters. And so when what happens to the Radium girls then happens, it's not just one woman in a family who is affected, but two or three or four. But in wartime, the fact that these women were working with their friends and cousins and sisters made for a wonderful camaraderie. And that was part of the appeal too. When I was researching the Radium Girls, I found photographs in the archives of company picnics, of the girls sitting on makeshift bridges across the little brook that ran behind the studio in New Jersey, swinging their legs in the water and eating ice cream cones. Catherine Donahue in Illinois remembered that actually the women used to wear their good dresses to the plant because when the Radium Girls went out dancing after work in the music halls and later the speakeasies of the Roaring Twenties, the Radium Girls would be wearing their party frocks covered in glowing, shining dust because the glamour of working with Radium was another part of its appeal. The women used to mix their own paint. They would use a kind of powdered radium and mix it with water and an adhesive. And in so doing, the dust would get everywhere as Catherine described in that opening chapter. So the women would get absolutely covered in these sparkling particles as one scientist described them. And so when the women did go out dancing, they'd be shining and shimmering on the dance floor. And when they walked home at night, it was such an ethereal sight to see the dial painters of Ottawa, Illinois, and of New Jersey walking home, glowing like ghosts, like spirits walking the streets. So much so that a nickname they attracted was actually rather darkly given the later outcome, the ghost girls. That's what the locals called them, the ghost girls walking home at night. But at the time we're talking about, the fact that the women got to work with Radium was perhaps the most attractive reason of all to join the studio. Because as crazy as it seems to us today, in 1917, the world thought of Radium as a wonder element and the women thought they were lucky to be working with it. It was seen not only as safe, but actually beneficial to health. And if you went into your local drugstore, you could buy radium dressings and radium pills to treat all manner of ailments, anything from gout to hay fever. And you could buy a range of other products as well. Radium butter, radium milk, radium chocolate, radium toothpaste to give you a brighter smile with every brushing. You could buy radium lingerie to boost your sex life. And people, the rich and famous in particular, also drank radium water as a health tonic. These people weren't sick. They were taking it to kind of ward off, you know, fatigue and uh, the sort of exhaustion of middle age. They were hoping to become useful again in the same way that today we might eat kale, for example. Radium water was seen as the thing that you had to consume to give you a little bit of pep. The recommended dose was five to seven glasses a day. Despite this situation, however, the Radium Girls didn't take the lip pointing technique on board when they were told to do it by their companies with blind faith. May Cubberley, who was the woman who trained Catherine Sharp in the lip pointing technique, said when she was told to put the paintbrush between her lips, she asked, 
does this stuff hurt you? But she was reassured. Her bosses told her that it was safe, that there was no need to be afraid. There was no danger. But that wasn't quite true. The book actually opens not with chapter one that I read to you earlier, but with a prologue dated 1901, 16 years before Catherine Sharp is going to work on that February day. And it opens with a scientist receiving a radiation burn from a vial of radium that he has in his waistcoat pocket. Actually, from the turn of the century, people did know that radium was dangerous. They knew it could give people radiation burns. They knew it could destroy human bone and tissue. And the fact that the radium companies knew this too can be seen in the fact that in the laboratories next door to where the girls are lip pointing in the studio, the lab workers are issued with safety equipment, lead aprons to protect them from the radioactive rays, ivory tip tongs so that they don't have to handle the radium with their bare hands. So what was the difference other than gender between these lab workers and the radium girls? Well, it was because the lab workers were handling large amounts. And actually, it was well proven that a large amount of radium could kill you. It was thought that a small amount was beneficial to health, and that is what was put into all those products that I described earlier. But when you dig a little deeper into who was funding the research that was proving that radium was safe in these small amounts, you realise it was the radium firms themselves who were funding that research and publishing the positive results that they uh, thought that they had found. And so actually that truth, as people thought of it as the time, suddenly starts to look quite questionable. And so time passed. But the radium girls found that even though it did, that they moved up, they grew up, they moved on, they moved away. They didn't necessarily stay as dial painters after the war finished. They found that even though they moved on, the radium moved with them. And to describe what was happening inside the women, it's important to know that radium essentially is a bone seeker. It acts in the same way as calcium initially. So if we drink a glass of milk, you probably know that the calcium in that milk will go into your bones and it makes them strong. Well, radium initially acts in the same way. When the radium girls consumed it, it settled in their bones, settled in their jaw bones or in their spines, all over their bodies in different amounts and different ways. And once there, once settled in their skeletons, it emitted that immense radioactive power that it has. Radium has a half-life of 1,600 years, which means it emanates its power for all those centuries before it diminishes in any regard. Coincidentally, the fact that it had this immense power was partly why people were trying to exploit it commercially. I actually found articles in the Newark Evening News that were urging its readers to eat radium tablets because they said doing so would add years to our lives. The idea was that if radium had this seemingly immortal power, well, if people consumed it too, they too could potentially live forever and certainly live for longer. But of course, the radium girls were now swiftly discovering that the opposite was true. Their suffering began slowly. Radium poisoning is an incredibly insidious type of poisoning. It takes years to show itself. So it wasn't until maybe five years later that the women really started to suffer. And their suffering began very innocuously, really. It might be a sore arm or an aching leg, maybe a tooth that would just ache and ache. And so that's how it started for Catherine Sharp. She went to the dentist to have the aching tooth pulled. But then the next tooth started to hurt. And then the next tooth. And then the next until Catherine didn't have to go to the dentist to have her teeth pulled anymore because they simply fell out on their own. Other women felt the pain in different places first. Grace Fryer felt it in her spine. 
Catherine Donahue in Illinois felt it first in her ankle, a pain that spread up slowly through her leg until it settled in her hip. Now, at the time, it was a medical mystery what was harming all these women in these different ways. Because of course they had worked with radium and they were young, just in their twenties now, they should be in the best of health. And so the women were dismissed when they went to their doctors. They were sent home with aspirin. When you realize the reality of what these women were enduring, you will be stunned by that revelation. Because what was happening inside these women was that they were being destroyed from the inside out. When they studied the radium girls later, they found that their bones were honeycombed and moth-eaten in appearance. They literally had holes in them. Holes that had been drilled there by the radium while the women were still alive. When they x-rayed Grace Fryer's spine, they found that her vertebrae were crushed by the radioactive power of the radium inside her. She had to wear a steel back brace to keep her erect. Other women found that their legs began to spontaneously fracture and other women still were crippled by the radium. Their hips would lock because of the way the radium was affecting them. And yet still, whenever they reported the problems to their medical practitioners, they were dismissed, diagnosed with rheumatism or arthritis and sent home with aspirin. Aspirin, when the radium is drilling holes in their bones. Catherine Sharp tried to describe the pain once and she said the only thing she could compare it to was like a dentist drilling on a live nerve, minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day. That's what these women endured. But what is incredible about these women is that even though they were suffering in this way, they themselves knew, as Catherine Sharp put it, there was something going on. And this is where those female friendships that had first brought them into the studio now came into their own. Because while the women had grown up and moved on from the studio, of course, those friendships had survived, those friendships with cousins and sisters and friends. And so the women talked to each other about their ailments and they decided they had to do something. Something had to be done. Tellingly, the medical authorities did not start to investigate until a particular thing happened. Even though dozens of young women had passed away from their radium poisoning, it wasn't until the 7th of June, 1925, that Harrison Martland, the chief medical examiner of New Jersey, began to investigate. On the 7th of June, 1925, the first male employee of the radium firm died. Only at that point did an expert start investigating. Only at that point was it proven medically and scientifically that radium was hurting, crippling, and killing the radium girls. But even at that juncture, the radium companies refused to admit responsibility. They tried everything they could to cover up what was happening. They tried everything in their power to silence these women. But what is remarkable about the radium girls is the way they fought back and they refused to be silenced. They used their last vestiges of energy to try to hold these companies to account. So that even though they hired private detectives to dig up dirt on the girls, the girls kept on fighting. My book describes what happens next, the way that these women decide to embark on a landmark legal fight for justice and the sheer altruism of these women being told that there was absolutely no hope for themselves, but being determined to fight on because it was important to ensure that this tragedy did not happen to anyone else. One of my favorite quotes in the book comes from Grace Fryer. And she said when she was filing suit, she was asked why she was doing it. And she said, it is not for myself that I care. I am thinking more of the hundreds of other girls to whom this may serve as an example. And that is just extraordinary to me. And I think the Radium Girls are examples to us all. 
They're examples of what you can achieve if you band together with like-minded individuals and you fight for what you believe in. They're an example that no matter how powerless you may feel, you can make a difference in the world. And what a difference the Radium Girls made. Their legacy is extraordinary because they didn't only change the laws to protect other women and other workers. They didn't only change science for good. Actually, these women contributed to science and to history throughout the rest of the 20th century and beyond. Because of their unique scientific value, because these women had been exposed to radiation in a totally unique way, they were studied for decades and the women volunteered for those scientific studies. It meant that the world could gain knowledge from their bodies, from the sacrifice that had unwittingly been made by these immensely strong women. And that benefit was felt by the world almost immediately. In the Second World War, for example, the Allies were working on the Manhattan Project where they were using radioactive materials that were biomedically very similar to radium. And the lead scientist on the Manhattan Project wrote in his diary that he was inspired by the radium girls to insist that research was conducted on the properties of uranium and plutonium. And thanks to him, safety standards were then put in place based on the bodies of the radium girls so that the workers on the Manhattan Project were not harmed. And their legacy is felt even stretching beyond that into the 1950s and 60s when there's a nuclear arms race happening across the globe. Well, partly thanks to those studies on the radium girls, President Kennedy signed the Limited Test Ban Treaty in 1963, prohibiting atomic bomb tests above ground and in space and underwater. And that was all due to the radium girls and the knowledge that increasing the radiation uh, in the human body is not a good thing. So there's an awful lot we have to thank them for. Even today, NASA is now using the data collected on the radium girls to think about how space radiation may affect astronauts traveling to Mars. It's a truly extraordinary legacy. And yet so many people have never heard the story. And you may be wondering, how did I, a British woman, come across it? Well, the short answer is, I didn't know anything about the Radium Girls either. But in the spring of 2014, I was sitting on my sofa in London and I was thinking about wanting to direct a play. And so I Googled great plays for women because as a female director, I like to put on plays where women are at the heart of the story and there are great opportunities for actresses. So I Googled great plays for women and a play that came back on that internet search was called These Shining Lives by Melanie Marnich. And it's about the Ottawa dial painters, about Catherine Donahue and her friend Pearl Payne and the other women who worked in that small town in Illinois. And the moment I found it, I was hooked. I really deeply connected with this story instantly. When the script arrived, I read only the opening monologue and I turned to my husband and I said, this is the play I'm going to direct next. It was that immediate that this was a story I felt destined, compelled to tell. Because it's a story that's universal in its power. Women fighting for justice, fighting against the odds. Women proving themselves. Women suffering tragedy and heartbreak. Yes, and it is such a tragic, heartbreaking story but also it's a story about strength and sisterhood and sheer spirit. I applied to Melanie Marnich's agent to put on the play in London and the answer came back, no, no, I couldn't put the play on. Well, I would not take no for an answer. Already this story was so important to me. And so I was determined that I had to stage it. So I phoned the agent in America and essentially begged to be allowed to put the play on. My pitch line, incidentally, was Erin Brockovich meets Maiden Dagenham starring the Pink Ladies. I explained how passionate I was. I explained how much it meant to me. And ultimately, the agent relented and I got the yes that I was looking for. 
And the moment I did, I started researching because I knew the play was based on a true story and I felt compelled to do justice to these real women. So I read everything that I could find on the Radium Girls. And at that time, there were two other books, one on their extraordinary legal legacy and another on the science of the story. But as hard as I looked, I couldn't find any account that focused on the women themselves. In my rehearsals with my cast, I was imagining what the women's wives were like, you know, what were their weddings like? Did they have lots of sisters and brothers? Um, I wanted to know every personal detail about them, but I couldn't find the facts out there in the world that would tell me what really happened and what was really authentically true for Catherine Donahue and Pearl Payne. I wanted to know who the women were, but the world at that time could not tell me. And so I felt stunned actually that no one had written an account of the Radium Girls story that actually focused on the Radium Girls themselves. And by this point, midway through my rehearsal period for my play, I felt so strongly that these women deserved such a book. They deserved a tribute to them. They deserved a book that looked honestly at their suffering and their sacrifice, and yet also celebrated the triumphs that they had along the way. And so it was a kind of daunting decision in a way, because this is a story full of science and full of law and full of history. And I'm not a scientist and I'm not a historian. I studied English at college and I'm definitely not a lawyer. But ultimately I thought, well, if no one else has done it, why don't I? And so I pitched my book on the Radium Girls and I was lucky enough to get a book deal. And I came to America to research it. And that was so important to me because I wanted to physically occupy the places where the Radium Girls had lived and died. I wanted to literally follow in their footsteps. I wanted to walk the streets that they had walked, to go into the churches where they had worshipped, to visit the sites of the Radium Dial Painting Studios. More than anything else on that trip, however, I was looking for the women's own words. And stunningly, I uncovered them. The women had left their own record behind of what it was really like to be a radium girl. They had told their story in letters, in diaries, in memoirs, in court testimonies, in newspaper interviews. Their words were there in first person, telling me intimately what these women were thinking and feeling at different points in their story. And they were just sitting there, dusty in an archive, just waiting for someone to listen. I want to share with you one of the most powerful moments on my research trip, which occurred when I went to Utica in Illinois. And I had bounded through the door full of enthusiasm to the local museum there, because I'd heard on the grapevine they might have some Radium Girls material. And I said to the docent, I'm researching a book on the Radium Girls. I'm here to see you know, your material. Um, and she looked really confused. And she said, well, I'll show you what we have, but I really don't know how helpful you're going to find it. And she walked me over to a glass display cabinet and there was a single photograph of the girls at work and a copy of the book on their legal legacy. And that was it. And I said, are you sure you don't have anything else? And she said, no, this is all we have. And I sort of thought about it for a minute. And then I said, well, would you mind if we asked your manager, please? I was terribly British and polite about it. And so we went over and asked her boss and he was a snowy haired gentleman and he kind of scratched his head and he said, oh, I think there might be something in the back. Feel free to take a look. And so I went into the back office of this local museum and I pulled a dusty folder off the shelf and started going through it. And in that dusty folder, in that small back room of that local museum, I found handwritten letters between Catherine Donahue and Pearl Payne. And I can't tell you the power of that moment because I had directed actresses to play these women on stage. And perhaps that more than any other moment in my research trip made me realize these women are real. They went through this, they picked up their pencil to write these letters. I could literally touch the paper with my hand and feel the indentation that Catherine Donahue had made with her pencil 70 years before. 
I was overwhelmed by the discovery, but even more overwhelmed by Catherine's own words as she talked to Pearl about the isolation she felt. She was sent away from her, her family to be in hospital. She talked about her worry for her husband out of work in the midst of the Great Depression and her concern for her two young children who she knew if she succumbed to this, this awful, awful poisoning, she knew would be left alone without a mother to raise them. The family members were the final part of my research. The husbands who knew they would not see through their lives with their wives. The parents who had to bury sometimes not just one daughter, but two or three or four. And the children who had to grow up without their mothers. These were the people I wanted to talk to because my passion was for the individual radium girls and who knows us better than our families. And so I reached out to the relatives of the women I was writing about. And I was lucky enough to speak to nieces and nephews, to sons and daughters, to sisters of the Radium Girls. Every single family I approached was universally generous in their response. They threw open their homes to me. They brought along their scrapbooks and their family albums, any material that they might have collected over the years. They took me out for lunch. They escorted me to gravesite visits and to different museums and together we uncovered the story. They told me details I could never have found anywhere else, what the women like to wear, what their voices sounded like, what they like to cook. And in this way, I hope I've been able to bring these women back to life through the memories of their families and through the women's own words. If you read the Radium Girls, I hope it is to hear from the Radium Girls themselves because I've interweaved all that incredible first person material that I found in the archives into the book. So you can hear from Catherine Donahue and Grace Fryer about what they were really thinking and feeling. In my job, I often work as a ghostwriter. That's what I did before writing a history book like the Radium Girls. And I feel really strongly that even though my name is on the cover of the book, this is their story, that I'm almost the ghost writer for the ghost girls, because it's their words that have the power. It's their story, it's their family's recollections that really bring this story to life in the pages of my book. And I will be forever grateful to those families for sharing all those intimate details with me, because they weren't easy interviews at times. And I want to close the presentation today by sharing with you my memories of an interview with Catherine's niece and nephew. They were describing for me Catherine's sick room at the end. I was really asking them to bring it to life for me, thinking about the senses, what she might have heard, what the room might have smelt like, what it looked like. They described for me that the big wooden crucifix that Catherine used to keep on the wall above her bed and they also talked how she liked to keep the shades drawn so that the room was always dark. But Catherine's nephew recalled that even though the room was dark, there was a light inside it from Catherine herself, because the radium with which she had once made watches and clocks glow in the dark had settled in her skeleton. And from there, it was emitting its ghostly glow. According to her nephew, he could see every bone in her body as she lay on her sickbed, glowing from the radium that was slowly killing her. I asked about the sounds of the room too. I asked her niece Mary about that. I said, did Catherine ever cry out with the pain that she was in? And Mary closed her eyes as she answered me. And I could tell she wasn't with me in her sitting room in Aurora, Illinois anymore. She had gone back 70 years in the past and she was with her Aunt Catherine in that intense sick room towards the end of Catherine's life. She took a long time to answer, but eventually Mary shook her head and she said no. No, she didn't cry out. She didn't have the energy to scream. All she could do was moan. She was just moaning, moaning. 
Perhaps what I'm most proud of in my book is that even though Catherine Danny Hugh lost her voice at the end, in this book, she speaks again and you can hear her. You can hear her extraordinary story, this special woman who literally gave evidence on her deathbed so that she could hold this company to account. This woman who defied the doctor's predictions that she would die if she did, because it was more important to her to fight for justice. This woman who was totally extraordinary in every way. It's been my honor to help them have a voice. And so I want to close the presentation today by saying thank you for listening to them. Thank you. We're now ready to move to questions. So I think the library is gonna come on and help moderate those questions. So if you do have any, please pop them in the chat and hopefully we'll manage to get to them all. Thank you. Okay, this is um, Christy from the library. Um, couple of things to let folks know um, while we're waiting for people to post questions in the chat um, that if anybody wants to get a copy of this book, The Radium Girls, or um, your latest book, um, they can go to Prey Fox Books, correct? Prey Fox Books links. in Ottawa, Illinois, yeah. And those links are up at the beginning of the chat. So, and we have somebody here um, who asked, what's your next project? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Um, I don't know is the honest answer. I'm currently researching ideas. Um, I possibly found something last night, but it's too, too early to know if it's gonna be the one I've got to do a lot more digging first. Um, so I'm currently in that zone of, having my antennae quivering to see if anything sort of strikes me to say, this is the story I, I should tell next. Um, I want to try to find something that really connects with me and that I feel passionate about. I think that's quite important. Um, so I've had several ideas, but they're not quite singing to me at the moment. So currently TBC, um, so it will probably be several years before the next book is out, but I hope uh, people will still be with me whenever it is what I decide upon. Um, and in the meantime, if you haven't read The Woman They Could Not Silence, which was my follow up book to The Radium Girls, which has just come out in paperback, um, I hope people might pick that up uh, as, as another Kate Moore book to read. It tells the true story of Elizabeth Packard. Uh, it's another Illinois story for the lots of people that I know are, are, are joining us from Illinois. Um, it's 1860s America. And the sort of opening proposition of the book is what would happen if your husband could commit you to an insane asylum just because you disagreed with him? That's what happens to Elizabeth. And it's about her extraordinary battle for survival uh, and the extraordinary twist that her life then takes once she's in the asylum and what she ends up doing uh, to help change the world. Um, I hope people will uh, enjoy it. It's got Lots of drama, just like the Radium Girls. There's courtroom drama, there's gothic horror, as I take you inside the insane asylums of the 19th century. Um, it's got a strong female heroine fighting for justice against the odds. Um, so lots and lots of uh, similar things to enjoy that Radium Girls had. Okay, um, a couple other questions. Um, uh, one is, I'm interested how you nourish your tour intuition. Um, how, how I interested my intuition. Um, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, how do I in, uh, nourish my intuition? Uh, I think you've just got to sort of be open to listening to yourself, really. I think I'm a person who feels quite deeply and I try to be open uh, to how those feelings are making me feel. Um, and I think sometimes you just know there's a sort of, you know, like I said about that connection with this, with the script when I found it instantly. Sometimes you just know, I think in the same, like I knew when I met my husband, 
he was the man I was going to marry you know I'd you know we got together and within a month I was like right he's the one so I think sometimes you just know I, I don't know how you nourish that I think it's just about being open to listening to what you're feeling inside I know some people uh, sort of don't and I think it's a really important thing to do for all aspects of life all right um also somebody asked um do you have a website I do you yes you you can visit me at www.kate-more.com so kate-more.com and um, that's got information on all the books that I've written including the books that I've ghostwritten um, it's got my contact email on there. My email is essentially kate at kate-more.com, kate-more.com. Um, I welcome people dropping me a line. It's also got my events. So I'm doing a tour in April for the woman they could not silence. So um, I mentioned uh, just before we started the presentation, I'm going to be in Colorado. I'm also visiting North Carolina, uh, California, Illinois. I'm doing an event at Prairie Fox Books. Um, and I think that's everywhere. Um, but do take a look at the website, www.kate-more.com. Thank you. Another question. Um, did the radium companies offer compensation at some point? Were they found guilty of anything? And were the families given any benefits? Um, well, I shall... Um... I never quite, I never like quite like uh, to give spoilers away because, um, as I say, the book is written as a novel. So um, I hope people will have shocks and twists and turns along the way. What I can say is that some radium companies did offer compensation uh, to different individuals, but shockingly, um, those levels of compensation are literally just so horrific. Um, for example, one woman, uh, a woman called Mildred Cardo, who was a Connecticut dial painter, she was um, she died age 22, just six months after she'd been married. And her husband was offered compensation for his wife's death. But the amount of money that the radium company offered to her husband was forty three dollars and seventy five cents for a woman's death. So there were some compensation payments, if you can call them that. Um, as for guilt, um, yes, um, there was a guilty verdict at one point. Um, and as for the families gaining benefits, as I explained, um, financially, uh, there was not uh, a lot even on offer. Um, so even with the pursuit of justice, um, financially, there, there wasn't benefit, really. Um, it saved some people from, uh, you know, bankruptcy, but nothing like you might imagine there should have been. Um, and that, again, you know, drives home to me how extraordinary it was that the Radium Girls embarked on this fight and pursued it with such commitment because it was never about the money. Um, it was always about getting, you know, the, the moral victory because, as I say, the companies tried to dismiss what the women were saying was true. So the women were called liars and cheats and frauds, often by people in their own communities as well. Um, so they wanted... The verdict to prove what had happened to them and to ensure that other people were protected. Kind of following up to that question, was there any outrage expressed from the broader community toward the company once these adverse effects became apparent? Was there like picketing, strikes from other workers, boycotting? Well, um, again, the answer, the answer is mixed. Uh, as the danger started to be known, um, particularly in New Jersey, uh, they did experience a drop in the workforce. That's partly why they finally start to investigate and, and start to pay attention to what's happening to their former workers um, because it's affecting the bottom line and finally they need to do something about it. Um, later on in the story, you know, because fighting for justice takes decades, so we move into the 1930s and the Great Depression hits. Um, and of course, at that stage, the communities are very much behind any employer who is left. So as I say, the women were actually marginalized um, and not listened to. And shockingly, the research that I uncovered, you know, included some interviews with community people from sort of the 1970s. So well after, you know, it's been proven that radium was hurting the women, they were telling the truth, they were absolutely entitled to compensation. You know, this, this was a fact that they had been poisoned by the workforce. 
even in the 1970s, some questionnaires with some other Ottawa residents were saying, oh, you know, Peg Looney, you know, she was always, um, you know, sick, uh, you know, it, it, they didn't, still they were maintaining the fiction that it wasn't the company that had killed her, that actually these girls were sick to begin with, or there was something physically wrong with them, you know, outside of what had happened. Um, in another question, somebody um, asked, is, is, can you go visit the, the grave sites of the Radiant Girls? Um, you can. What I would say, though, is that I know some family members. Um, I, I think at, at one grave, there was just like a flag put up so that people could find it more easily. And they objected to that quite understandably because their grave sites are not a tourist destination. You know, they're their place of rest. So I would say you can go. Um, but obviously, you know, and I know people want to go to pay their respects and I personally don't have a problem with that, but just be mindful that, you know, where where people are and what they're doing. I, I think I'd say just having spoken to some of the families, um, that would be my response. So yes, you can go and visit the graves, you know, they're in the local cemeteries. Um, it, it was a huge thing for me to go and pay my respects. And I know that several other readers have gone to do that because they felt so moved by their story, having read the book. In another question, were the caregivers of the girls contaminated by being in contact with them? Um, again, the answer varies. Um, I did find examples in the record that there was a radium girl who used to share a bed with her sister who never dial painted or worked a day in the studio in her life. The sister died of radium poisoning because the radium girl came home covered in that radioactive dust and obviously, as they lay side by side in bed, the non-dial painted sister would have inhaled it and um, she did get contaminated and she did die of radium poisoning. Um, they did some studies on other relatives and they found that, uh, you know, other people were not affected at all. So I think it depends how close you got what the, you know, individual circumstances were. So some were affected, but not all. Did you in your research discover if the watch dials they painted are considered a radium hazard? Um, what I find interesting about this question is my answer has changed since I've been talking about the book. So when I first published it in 2017, um, people would say, you know, it, it is a radium watch that they might have inherited, is that a problem? And the answer used to be, no, it's fine. Um, if it's particularly if it's intact, basically, if, if it's broken in any way, then it will be a hazard and you should get rid of it. But the answer used to be if it's still intact and it's got the glass covering um, over the radium numbers, you should be fine because the alpha rays will be blocked by the glass coating and it should be fine. Don't tinker with it. But there was a study that was published in 2018 by the University of Northampton. And that looked at, in particular, large stashes of radium watches. So, you know, collectors of these things where they might keep them in, in a box or whatever. And those watches were seen to be giving off a level of radon, which is the gas radium decays into, that was, um, I think, 134 times higher than was safe. Um, radon is a leading cause of lung cancer uh, in the US and all over the world. And so now the the advice in response to that 2018 study is it's probably preferable to get rid of it um, if you really don't have to keep it anymore um, because of the radon that might be emanating uh, from the watch as the radium decays. Thank you for that. Um, is it known if any of the children of the radium girls suffered from any form of radium posed poison or transfer? Um, they've never done any official studies on it. So I always answer this question with the preface that it's based on anecdotal evidence uh, and me speaking to just a handful of relatives. And the answer again is that it differs. From what I have gathered from the people that I've spoken to, it really depended on when the women gestated their babies. So in, for example, Quinta McDonald's case, who, um, you know, leaves 
the studio um even you know just as the war is ending and she gets married and becomes pregnant very quickly and has her babies very young before she herself is showing any signs of radium poisoning um those children were fine um and you know i spoke to the daughter of her sister who also was uh, a dial painter who was affected um that woman, that daughter was in her 90s and had no ill effects whatsoever. And um, so if the women had their children before they themselves were suffering, there doesn't seem to be anything that was passed on. Women who gestated their babies later, you know, perhaps after 10 years working in the studio, for example, they do seem to have been affected. You know, you think about Mary Jane in the book, the daughter of Catherine Donoghue, um, even her son, Tommy, who died before the age of 30. Um, you know, they uh, do seem to have been affected by the mother's poisoning. From speaking to, informally to some doctors about it, they were saying that if a woman's body, obviously, if it has the radiation in it, a fetus that is being gestated within that radioactive body will be affected. So if a woman is sick, if she's showing signs of her radium poisoning, then it's more likely that her child may be affected. Okay. And we had um, another question come in, um, and this individual writes, when I've been to Ottawa, I have always felt like I should carry a Geiger counter <laughs> with me. Has, has the radium been adequately cleaned up from the studios and the buildings around the area? Well, what I can say is that I believe the cleanup is still going on. I'm not quite sure what the pandemic has done to things, um, but certainly when I was there last, which I think was uh, 2019, I think, pre-pandemic, um, the cleanup was still happening. So um, slowly they're getting to grips with it. And obviously you have to trust that they are doing it properly and that what remains is decontaminated and they've shipped off the soil um, that is radioactive. Um, so, you, yeah, there, there have been cleanup operations. I believe they're still going on, particularly in Ottawa. Um, but these things obviously take a long time uh, to get to get through. Um, incidentally, I believe that the subway in Ottawa, I'm not sure if it's been built yet or not, but that was planning permission was approved for a subway on the site of the Dial Painting Studio. Um, so I know the relatives that I know that are still living there were a bit like, mm, I'm not sure I'm going to eat that. And this is not me saying boycott subway but um just so you know it's um that's where the site um is apparently so you would think they perhaps have cleaned it up sufficiently in new jersey there's a children's playground on the site of the new jersey studio we 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 have one last question and then i, I i'd like linda um from the DAR to make any closing remarks as well as Kate. So in our last question, do you, um, did you any research or co coordinate with families of victims of radium dial factories in France for your book? No, I didn't um, is, the, is the very short answer. Um, I focus solely on America in my research. I've had a few people from the UK that have contacted me since who were families of radium girls from the UK, um, but I haven't done any research and haven't heard from anyone um, in France about the people that were affected there. So, so either Kate or Linda, do you have any closing remarks? This has just been, wow, what a great presentation. Thank you again to, to the, the local chapter for letting us all kind of cozy in on, on your time. This, this was great. What a great thing. And you're, you're all doing great work. Kate, we're so pleased that you were taken by this topic and you didn't let go. You've told the story which really needed to be told and you've shared it with the world. So we're thankful for that. And we're thankful for your time today. We enjoyed it very much. It's been my absolute pleasure and privilege. 
to join you today, to be invited today. Thank you so much, Linda um, and DAR for inviting me. And as Christy said, for generously opening up to the public as well. I really appreciate that because I'm so passionate about hearing this, you know, making sure this story is, is heard and is told. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you to the library for hosting. Thank you to everyone for joining. I saw the sort of scroll through some of the comments in the chat. You were saying some lovely things. So thank you very much. Um, I will just pick up on something in the chat. I saw someone was a teacher and they asked me if I do Zoom presentations. Yes, I do. Um, if you want to contact me about that, um, kate at kate-more.com or just look at my website, kate-more.com. Um, but yes, I do do Zoom presentations um, for everyone, actually, whether you're a school, another library, a workplace, if it's relevant. Um, so if anyone wants to invite me, please feel free to drop me a line. Um, but in the meantime, thank you so much to everyone for joining me. Thank you for hosting. Um, Prairie Fox Books in Ottawa, Illinois have the books um, if anyone wants to. Uh, go there and just thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so we, if we will be signing off again, we thank everyone for joining us today. There will be next week um, an archived version of this um, presentation available on the library's website. So um, we, we, we hope um, again that you've enjoyed this. Um, also, I just like to mention too, I believe, because Kate did a presentation on her more recent book, for our library and I believe that is in our archive as well so so please enjoy and thanks again Kate what what a great thing thank, thank you. you so much have a great day everyone I know it's about midday for you guys over there so enjoy the rest of your day um, and I shall enjoy my evening here in the UK bye thank you bye bye thank you bye. thanks everyone bye. <laughs> oh my god